Hello, my name is Paul Kassebaum. I'm going to present an Equifax breach case study that I've put together. Let me start with an overview of the breach. The United States Department of Homeland Security warned Equifax to apply a patch to a vulnerability in Apache struts on the 8th of March in 2017. The warning was transmitted internally at Equifax, but the patch was not scheduled or applied due to a lack of accountability and management structure in the company. Regular scans by Equifax did not detect the vulnerability. Three to four months after the warning from DHS, the vulnerability was exploited, but not yet detected by the company. Four members of the Chinese People's Liberation Army were later indicted for carrying out the attack. The first sign that they had suffered an attack came on the 29th of July. The security team noticed suspicious traffic net network traffic on Equifax's consumer dispute website. They subsequently blocked the traffic. However, the suspicious activity continued, so the team took down the application entirely. The CIO reported this activity to the CEO the next day. In response to the string of suspicious activity, the company contracted with a law firm and a cybersecurity forensic firm to investigate the incidents. They also alerted the FBI. Within two weeks, the forensic investigation discovered that the incident's scope was significantly larger than originally expected. The attackers carried out reconnaissance, ran search queries to learn about the company's database, uploaded web shells to access the company's servers, collected credentials of users authorized to access the database, and stole the sensitive personal identifying information of approximately 148 million consumers, almost 20% of Equifax's accounts. The amount of stolen information was so vast that the company struggled to identify affected customers. After a couple of weeks of deliberation by the CEO and the board, Equifax published a press release of its findings on the 7th of September, six months after DHS warned the company to patch the ultimately exploited vulnerability. The CEO, Richard Smith, the CIO, and the CSO resigned within a month of the press release subjecting the company to a 31% fall in market capitalization. That's a loss of about $5 billion immediately after the press release shown in annotation one on this graph here. So that, uh, not, on, not only that, but they also suffered legal costs of $800 million beyond insurance coverage, which covered $125 million. Uh, incurred by January 2020. Also, government investigations by the federal governments of the United States and Canada, along with many of their constituent states and provinces. This timeline um, of key events that I showed in the prior slide uh, covers what I discussed, and the financial damages incurred by the company are shown here in, in this figure. Um, there was damage after the initial press release sh uh, shown in uh, this figure in Annotation 1. Uh, and Annotation 2 shows the impact of the publication of the company's Security and Exchange Commission's Form 10-K, which uh, in um, February, around February of 2020, which revealed the full long-term cost of the breach, primarily due to the legal damages I cited. Let me move on to um, another topic, uh, the organizational and governance issues. Equifax suffered from two significant interconnected organizational deficiencies. Its lack of a rational, rational accountability structure for security operations and its failure to properly execute its security policies. These problems in the design of the organization were ultimately the root causes of the vulnerability exploited in the 2017 breach. In typical organizations as large and complex as Equifax, the chief security officer typically reports to either the chief executive officer or the chief information officer. This was the structure at Equifax around 2005 um, when uh, the CEO was Thomas F. Chapman. In 2005, uh, Equifax uh, switched, uh, got a new chief executive officer in Richard Smith. Um, Richard Smith brought in a new chief, uh, a new chief security officer named Tony Spinelli, uh, who was tasked to create a massive plan to transform the company's IT organization and infrastructure. Um, Tony's plan um, 
uh, as Tony was trying to put the plan together to present to the board and the CEO, um, the chief information officer, Robert Webb, um, vehemently disagreed with key aspects of Tony's plan. And when uh, Robert and Tony's working relationship came to a head, the CEO decided to reconcile their differences by switching the CSO's direct manager to the chief legal officer, uh, shown in, in uh, around circa 2006 in this schematic. The state of the hierarchy at these uh, transition points are shown here. And unfortunately, the CEO let the dynamics between individual people alter the organization's accountability structure, which remained in place even as new people assumed the roles of CIO and CSO around 2010 and 2013. Segregating the IT and security teams from each other desynchronized their inherently inextricably linked operations and laid the groundwork for the failures that led to the 2017 breach. The policy and execution arms of security operations were split between the two teams. The policy created by the security team was to be handed off to the IT team to execute, which was to be subsequently verified by the security team again. There was a written policy covering how patching was to be done. It called for two roles to work together, a business owner and a system owner. The business owner was to be notified of newly available patches and to approve downtime needed to apply a patch. The system owner is responsible for applying a patch during the approved downtime. This policy, written by the security team, was never implemented by the IT team for the Apache Strut system, so no individuals were assigned to the roles of business or system owner. With the roles unfilled, the policy was a dead letter, gathering dust. The warning from DHS was swiftly rebroadcast by Equifax's Global Threat and Vulnerability Management team to about 400 plus people across the security and IT teams, but the message fell on deaf ears since no one saw the vulnerability as their responsibility to fix. This dysfunction in their patching process was identified prior to the 2017 breach as the result of an audit conducted in 2015. Due to the disconnect between the IT and security teams, many of the findings and recommendations of the audit were not acted on. Most critically, the teams did not deploy automated patching tools that may have made them aware of the Apache Strut's vulnerability before it was too late. Besides the organizational root causes of the breach, uh, there were also technical root causes. The unpatched Apache Strut's vulnerability and Aquifax's cryptographic mismanagement. According to the indictment of four members of the Chinese PLA, the defendants exploited a vulnerability in the Apache Strut's web framework software used in Equifax's custom-built online dispute portal developed in the 1970s. They used this access to conduct reconnaissance of the portal and to obtain login credentials of authorized users that could be used to further investigate Equifax's network beyond the portal. The defendants spent several weeks running SQL's queries to analyze Equifax's database structure and searching for sensitive, personally identifiable information within Equifax's system. Once they accessed the files of interest, the conspirators then stored the stolen information in temporary output files, compressed and divided the files, and exfiltrated the data from Equifax's network to computers outside the United States. In total, the attackers ran approximately 9,000 queries on Equifax's system, obtaining names, birth dates, and social security numbers for nearly half of all American citizens. The breach's primary technical cause was, of course, the Apache Strut's vulnerability, tracked by the Common Vulnerabilities and Exposure Program of MITRE as CVE 2017-5638. The NIST National Vulnerability Database scores this vulnerability as critical, giving it 10 out of 10 points, and describes it as follows. The Jakarta multipart parser in Apache Struts 2, 2.3x before 2.3.32, and 2.5.x before 2.5.10.1 has incorrect exception handling and error message generation during file upload attempts, which allows remote attackers to execute arbitrary commands via crafted content type, content disposition, or content length, HTTP header, as exploited in the wild. 
and of course, March 2017. <laughs> the vulnerability occurs because the content type is not escaped after the error and then is used by localized text util dot find text function to build the error message. This function will interpret the supplied message and anything written within uh, dollar sign curly bracket braces uh, and will be treated as an object graph navigation library expression and evaluated as such. An attacker can use these conditions to execute OGNL expressions that in turn execute system commands on the host. The output and the status of the commands executed by the host can be returned, so no additional communication channels needed, making detection and prevention that much more difficult. The secondary technical cause of the breach was Equifax's failure to encrypt files containing user credentials. Such a file was found using the Apache Strut's vulnerability, but if it had been encrypted, the attackers would not have been able to expand the scope of their attack beyond the dispute portal to include 48 unrelated databases. The personally identifiable information exfiltrated from these database, databases was once again, unfortunately, unencrypted itself. Equifax did well to respond quickly, hiring a cybersecurity firm uh, to conduct an extensive forensic investigation, seeking outside legal counsel, and engaging the FBI. However, they took several actions that compounded their problems, causing hundreds of class actions and other lawsuits to be filed against them, and subjecting them to investigations and inquiries by federal, state, and foreign governmental agencies and officials. The first misstep in their response would only become public uh, after the wave of basic facts about the attack. Anticipating the inevitable cratering in stock values that the news of the breach would have, Jun Ying, the then CIO of Equifax, took it upon himself to sell his stock in the company, a clear case of insider trading. He received proceeds of over $950,000 and re realized a capital gain of over $480,000 avoiding a loss of over $117,000. Ying pled guilty on the 7th of March in 2019 and was sentenced to four months in prison to be followed by one year of a supervised release, ordered to pay restitution in the amount of um, the, the loss that he avoided, and was fined $55,000. <clears> Ying was the second Equifax employee found guilty of insider training in response to the breach following a previous manager. In the lead up to their public disclosure of the breach, they grossly underestimated the challenge of servicing the 149 million customers who had their PII exfiltrated, what customers would expect in restitution and the consequences of failing to meet their expectations. Adding insult to injury, the website required customers to enter their PII to be notified at some unspecified future date whether they had been affected by the breach gave incorrect or conflicting information about their exposure and couldn't even handle the flood of requests. When they chose to disclose the breach, they made additional missteps in their messaging. In a two-part message on Twitter, Equifax corporate, Equifax's corporate accounts stated, quote, we recently discovered a cybersecurity incident involving consumer information. Once discovered, we acted immediately to stop the intrusion we apologize to our consumers and business customers for the concern and frustration this causes. Learn more at EquifaxSecurity2017.com. Well, this message would turn out to be troublesome because of their choice to create a new web domain for the Project Sparta website rather than use a subdomain of their main website, Equifax.com. On multiple occasions over the span of weeks, the company's official Twitter account responded to customer inquiries by accidentally directing them to a phishing site. Luckily, the fake site was set up by software engineer Nick Sweeting to educate people rather than steal their information. A banner on the top of his website read, quote, cybersecurity incident and important consumer information, which is totally fake. Why did Equifax use a domain that's so easily impersonated by phishing sites? Hmm. Once the consequences of the breach and their missteps in responding to it seemed to come to a crescendo, the CEO, CIO, and CSO retired, quote unquote, receiving many of the associated benefits and evading accountability. Richard Smith, the CEO, collected $90 million in his retirement. 
This should have further marred the company's reputation, demonstrating that the board of directors would not hold its executives to account. The Equifax incident response team did well to identify suspicious requests from an IP address in China by inspecting packets once they, once they fixed the SSL certificates in the ASIS application environment. They should have moved to have the IT team fix all of Equifax's SSL certificates to allow them to collect and investigate packets in the wider scope of the company's network since there was already reason to believe there were more expired certificates. They should have immediately shut down the ACES web portal to contain the threat, but instead they only blocked the ISP used by the Chinese IP address and continued their investigation by conducting vulnerability tests on ACES. <clears throat> Once the team had reason to believe the attackers had exfiltrated PII, they should have acted to remediate the threat by having the IT team change all the credentials required to access databases storing customer PII, encrypt the new passwords, and encrypt the PII at rest. To recover from the attack, the IR team should have created a system to email an alert to all customers whose PII was stored on the impacted databases. Such a conservative, proactive approach to recovery would have saved the company from the debacle associated with their reactive Project Sparta website. Since the leadership of the security team all retired after the breach, I doubt the IR team held a retro retrospective meeting to gather lessons learned, but if I was leading the team, I would have held one anyway. <clears throat> Equifax could have taken the following measures to prevent the 2017 breach or lessen its impact. I've categorized these according to the elements of the NIST cybersecurity framework. Um, uh, leaving off the parts that aren't relevant. So uh, in the identify category, they could have established multi-factor authentication and encrypted all of their password files, uh, create a privileged access management system that only allows certain entities to decrypt the PIA of customer segments, designate business and system owners for all elements of the IT infrastructure, and implement modernized IT solutions that could ease the identification of physical and software assets and their maintenance status. In the protect category, they could have enhanced their patch management processes and procedures, reduced the scope of sensitive data retained in backend databases, increased restrictions and controls for access, accessing data housed within critical databases, deployed additional web application firewalls and tuning signatures to block attacks, accelerate deployment of a privileged account management solution and deploy additional email protection technologies. In the detect category, they could accelerate the deployment of file integrity monitoring technologies on application and web servers, enhance vulnerability scanning, enforce additional network application database and system level logging, Enhance visibility for encrypted traffic by deploying additional inline network traffic decryption capabilities. Deploy additional endpoint detection and response agent technologies. Deploy additional email monitoring technologies. And finally, conduct regular internal penetration tests using the NIST penetration testing framework, plan, discover, attack, report to reveal vulnerabilities related to the authentication, access control, system hardening, application configuration and service configuration. The investigations of the Equifax breach offer key lessons that can benefit other organizations. Rational security accountability structure. An organization's security and IT team should work hand in hand, taking responsibility for both policy and execution together. Stronger security measures. Promptly applying security patches and updates to all software and systems in an organization, regular vulnerability assessments, and penetration testing can help identify and address potential weaknesses. 
Effective Incident Response Plan. Organizations should have a well-defined and tested incident response plan in place to ensure a swift and coordinated response to security incidents. Data Protection and Encryption. Encrypting sensitive data at rest and in transit is essential to protect it from unauthorized access. Additionally, organizations should implement robust access controls, limiting data access to authorized entities only. Transparent communication and customer support. It is crucial for organizations to proactively communicate with affected customers promptly and transparently in the event of a data breach, providing clear instructions on necessary actions to mitigate risks. Data minimization and retention policies. Adopting data minimization principles, organizations should limit the collection and retention of personally identifiable information to what is strictly necessary. Leadership's commitment to cybersecurity. Last but not least, organizations should ensure that cybersecurity risks are regularly discussed at the highest level of decision making. This includes allocating appropriate resources, establishing cybersecurity governance frameworks, and fostering a culture of security awareness throughout the organization. Now, I'll leave you, the audience, with some of what I consider to be the key resources uh, where you can dive in and learn even more about, about this data breach. Um, the first, uh, and I've listed these alphabetically, but um, the first on this list <clears throat> uh, is sort of a um, primary source is the Equifax's own uh, United States Security and Exchange Commission's Form 10-K uh, for any of the more recent years. I, I, I found uh, fiscal year 2019 to be when um, pretty much everything that was going to come out of the breach ha had either occurred or was about to, uh, about it had either been reconciled or, or about, was about to be reconciled in the courts. Next one I would recommend is NIST's um, <clears throat> uh, vulnerability database on the, the vulner on the primary technical root cause of uh, the vulnerability in Apache Struts. Next is a case study uh, from the Harvard Business School <clears throat> uh, focusing on this data breach. Next one, another primary resource is um, from the U US Department of Justice uh, explaining the indictment of the four uh, members of Ch the Chinese PLA. And last but not really not least at all, this is the most important one um, at the bottom of this list, is the U.S. House of Representatives Committee on Oversight and Government Reform's um, extensive um, investigation on the Equifax data breach. This is, this is an incredible resource um, and includes things like transcripts of um, uh, interviews that members of the committee had with uh, key executives and key players at, in Equifax at the time of the breach and leading up to it. So uh, with that, that is my case study for the MIT X-Pro cybersecurity course. Thank you. Take care.